Today on Locked On Red Wings, we welcome back Max Boltman of The Athletic as he helps us do a quarter of the way check-in on the Detroit Red Wings season. You're Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a podcast producer for the Daily J, WWJ News Radio podcast. Well, Scotty is the host of Locked On Tigers, as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And today we welcome back recurring guests and friend of the podcast, friend of pretty much all of the Detroit Red Wings podcasts in the area, I, I would find at this point, uh, Max Boltman, Detroit Red Wings beat writer for The Athletic. Uh, Max, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today, man? Hey, my pleasure, guys. I'm doing good. Uh, just watched... Uh... Some of the some pretty good World Cup action there. I thought for a second that Costa Rica was going to single handedly uh, knock both Germany and Spain out in one fell swoop. Electric day, electric day in the World Cup, man. Didn't watch a single minute of it. Have no idea what you're talking about. But <laughs> you, you two, you two can converse. Go for it. <laughs> it was crazy. It was, it was a it was a fun day for sure. That's fair. Um, so Max, as you know, but as the listeners are about to find out, we brought you in to do a quarter of the way check in on the Red Wings season. We're a little bit past that quarter way point, and it's at the point now where you can start to identify trends and how the Detroit Red Wings are playing and what to expect. So want to bring in somebody with your knowledge who's in the locker room, game in, game out, went, went to the West coast to cover them as well. I mean, that part always like is wild to me. Like you're not just here for the home games. Like you, you went out to the 10 o'clock games on the far West coast to watch that. Not 10 o'clock out there, bro. Yeah. It's not, it's not too bad there. It's it's (laughs) easy breezy 7 PM. (laughs) But so, I mean, I guess the first question is, is the Red Wings currently, are technically in points wise tied for third, but they're sitting at first in the wild card because of uh, regulation overtime wins. What is your th- overall thoughts so, thoughts so far on how the Red Wings have played and the season so far? Yeah, I mean that is that's a million dollar question, isn't it? I mean that you can see I mean, kind of the game last night. I thought summed up their season in a lot of ways. It's, it's just like. You know, what do you want to take away from it? You can take away from it that they are better at 22 games into the season than I thought they would be. They are better 22 games in than they were last year. Uh, and yet they are still very far from being the team who, who I think they want to be, that they've shown a few key things that, that they've really leaned on. Uh, last night was a great, uh, you know, picture of kind of their their will, their refusal to uh, to get just beaten down, I think. And that's even improved over the course of a year. Uh, you can see, go look back at the last time they played Buffalo and see how that's continued to evolve. But but they've shown a lot of that will uh, on a lot of nights, and, and I think that's carrying them a lot. Um, I know that that can sometimes sound cliche, so I can also get into kind of the, their special teams are better. That is helping them. They were not better last night, and that hurt them. And that kind of tells you how fragile relying on, on good special teams is. Uh, and then obviously Billy Huso has, uh, has been really strong for them in net most nights, and I think you, you guys saw on, on Monday – uh, what's going to happen if, if he doesn't keep that up. So th- it's a little bit of like, what do you want to see in, in this team? I think if you wanted to just see some kind of progress, uh, you're seeing that. But I know there are also people out there who worry about being in that, I think they call it the mushy middle, where you're not in the bottom 10, but you're not a playoff team. And what does that mean for your ability to kind of acquire players? And And I think those people would be justified in being worried as well. So I, I see a team that's making progress that still has two recent top 10 picks in their pipeline uh, who have not debuted yet. Going to get another pick probably in the top 15 uh, this year and, and have a couple of other good prospects that I, I think that's enough to um, to make them a, a really good team. But, I, you know, I know everyone who has weathered this rebuild wants to hear it's going to make them a, a top cup contender. And, you know, I, I think that story is still very much uh, – you know, kind of being written of, of if they can reach that point. So uh, I don't know. That's not the simplest answer to your question, Brian, but I think uh, there's a lot, a lot to say or a lot to get into with this team. I call the middle, the Detroit Pistons. That's what I call like that middle area in the standings. Cause for the entire decade of the 2010s, the Pistons were like the best team to miss the playoffs. And were right. The Ben irrelevant. Gordon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The Charlie V Pistons. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. That, yeah, that is the, that is what I, I call that area. There was, um, there was an, 
article that made the rounds, I want to say over the weekend, last weekend maybe, it was probably around Thanksgiving actually, and it basically just highlighted the fact that on American Thanksgiving, like it, I think it was in the last six or seven years, like 77%, I think yeah. was the number that they cited in, the, in their article of teams that are in the playoff picture on American Thanksgiving make the postseason. And part of me found that super misleading because like the top teams, like obviously, right? Sure, like yeah. they're not going to crumble that, that – that's enough of a buffer for me to justify like the middle teams, like the position that we're in. But I think I think that it's a it's a pretty common benchmark to use is like American Thanksgiving quarter of the way through the season. And and so I don't know, not like do you hold any merit in that because it's totally like fabricated. But at this point in the season, do you think that the locker room considers like what they've done so far as success? Like are is is coaches and, and players, are they happy with like where they're at right now? I think it yeah, again, it kind of just comes back to like relativity, right? Like it's Fair. you know when when Lalone talks about the team, he's constantly with us pointing to hey, you know, the, the underlying numbers say this, so just be careful with how you talk about X, Y, Z, but at the same time, they're really happy that they're getting the outcomes. And I think that he was really happy with how they played last night, even though they didn't get the outcome. So there's things they're happy about. And, um, you know, to your point about in, in the locker room, what do you guys think? You know, someone asked Dylan Larkin about this exact stat the other night, like this American Thanksgiving 70, whatever percent, three quarters of the time yeah. you make it. And they asked him like, are you a believer in this? And he said, I'm a believer that, uh, if you if you're in a playoff spot at Easter, <laughs> you're in a good spot, right? Which is obviously when the playoffs start. So uh, I like that. I I think that tells you that their goals are higher than just being in it at at Thanksgiving. And you know it, it's but the thing is, it's still better than the alternative, right? Like it, you you'd rather be in this spot than be out of it, like you've been right. in a couple of recent seasons. But you look at that stat and it tells you that you know three or four of the teams that are currently in the playoffs won't be, and three or four that aren't will be, and I got to think the Red Wings are probably maybe the most kind of obvious candidate of the teams that currently is in it to not be, it'd probably be either them or Seattle. So um, I don't think you could put too much stock in it in terms of what it tells you they will be, but it does speak to what they have been through 22 games. And that's a pretty good team. So, and they have been a pretty good team through 22 games. And like I said, they're sitting in a playoff spot currently. Scotty just, gave a, a wonderful number that we totally all are buying in on and that the Red Wings are going to make the playoffs. Um, but what, what do you think is the main reason Scotty and I have our own beliefs as to why the Red Wings have seen extra success early on this season compared to last season. But what have you seen that you think has led to the biggest amount of added success so far? I think I'd probably point to two things. The power play uh, is probably the biggest one. That's something the Red Wings have not had at all. Uh, in my time covering the beat, they've never had a power play that, I mean, I think they're converting it still, even after a, a rocky night last night where they went over for seven and botched a five on three, I think they're still above 20% on the year yeah, they, or something like that. They are 20, yep. 20.5. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's something they haven't had since I've been on the beat. And I, I think you can look at David Perron and, and Dominic Kubelik as, as big drivers on that, but you zoom out a little more. And what really is, is it's the infusion of guys they put in there, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. Piranha, it's Kubelik, it's Huso, who's been really good for them in net. Um, Andrew Kopp, I know, started slow. I thought he was awesome in the third period last night. Yeah. Like a huge difference maker. Obviously, he had the two assists, but um, he started to come on, I think. Uh, Oli Mata, I don't, you know, I don't know. Of, of all the guys they signed, he probably gets the least attention. And I think he's maybe made one of the biggest impacts in, in helping to unlock Philip Hironik and um, get him back to the point where he's produced. Philip Hironik is like one of the top scoring defensemen in the NHL right now. And 20 I think a big points part of in it. 22 games. Right. And that's unheard of, right? Like you don't, you know, he, he's always been a productive guy. He's all, you could set your watch to him getting half a point per game, but now he's knocking on point per game. And however long that keeps up, you know, everyone can kind of decide that for themselves, but um, it, it it's hard to argue that he has been, better this year like he, he just has and that's I, I i give him a lot of credit for that but i also give olimata credit for that so that's the biggest reason to me i mean i think you can look micro and say you know they have this source of offense that they haven't had in the past but even if you take a step back from that why is the power play better i think it's just because the players are better yeah above i mean they've the players are better they're scoring a lot off the rush i notice a lot off the rush you mentioned it earlier huso's been phenomenal and he's one of those guys that they brought in through acquisitions 
um, they traded for him. But like you said, all those free agents, I mean, it's, it's been great to see that they've been playing so much better, but they're not perfect either. And there's been a lot of reasons why they haven't won some games like last night, for example. Um, and we'll get to that. But first I got to talk to the people today about betonline.net. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get to the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From football to basketball, soccer, and esports, they've got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, they've got those at BetOnline as well. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline, where the game starts. Segment two. Two Locked On Red Wings podcasts. We have Max Boltman, Detroit Red Wings beat writer for The Athletic, joining us today. And uh, he's helping us kind of talk about what we are seeing from the Detroit Red Wings at the quarterway point of the season, just kind of check in. And you, we finished off segment one talking about what we've seen that's been an improvement. But not everything's been, you know, great. There have been yeah. definitely some shortfalls for the Detroit Red Wings. Um, what have you seen as a shortfall so far that the Red Wings have got to get over as a hurdle? Well, I think one thing, you know, I don't know if this is too abstract, but just kind of the consistency, you know, night to night. Uh, it's hard to know what you're necessarily going to get. Usually if they're at home, you're going to get a, a pretty strong effort from them. And um, I, I think, you know, you've heard them, Dylan Larkin, I think the other night credited the, the fans a ton for, um, you know, what, what they were able to uh how they were able to impact the Red Wings. And I've heard that. I mean, last night on the way back, uh, on, on their comeback, the arena was awesome. I don't know. Were either of you guys there on, on Wednesday night? No, but I was watching you from the comfort of the couch. The TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. I mean, it's it definitely shows up. So um, I, I think that's, you know, their home, their home ice, they've been pretty good on the road. It's been a little more hit or miss. Um, you know, part of that is it the schedule. I think they, they've had a tougher road schedule probably than they have uh, home schedule, but even that, you know, they, they find a way to blow a game to the Anaheim Ducks that I don't think they had any business losing. And uh, so there's stuff like that. But it, more concretely, I think it's just kind of finding ways to generate offensive danger at, at even strength. We talked about the power play being improved. Um, you know, the, the five on five offense, if you go by kind of expected goals for, you know, the, the rate stat would be per 60 minutes. They're seventh from the bottom in the league. That's like 25th, right? And so um, that's obviously not as good, not as compelling as as where they are in the standings. That tells you, okay, there's maybe a little more to be concerned about here. The flip side is they've been pretty good defensively at at five on five. I mean, they're they're knocking on the door at the top ten in that metric, and maybe that's a little bit of a trade off. That was obviously the priority for Steve Eiserman uh, when he hired Derek Lalone and made some of these front age, uh, front uh, free agency decisions. Um, and, and you've seen that pay off, but um, I think they do need to find ways to, to score more at five on five. That will help them weather kind of those ups and downs of, of the power play. I mean, you, you look at a power play and you hear, okay, it's converting at 20%. Um, in theory, that means one out of every five, but it doesn't go goal, no goal, no goal, no goal, no goal, no goal, goal, <laughs> no goal, no goal, no goal, no goal, goal, right? It, sometimes you're going to get three for four. You're going to win those nights. Other nights you will get I, as much as you'd hope not to get an 0 for seven. They happen. And the Red Wings almost survived it anyway because they scored four goals at even strength. Um, but the more consistent, you know, you can just get that offense. Ideally, you're not giving up for uh, either, but the more consistent you're able to produce it at five on five, you can set your watch to being able to score close to three goals a game at five on five. Then all of a sudden you're, you're one of the top teams in the league, right? So uh, even if you get close, you get to 2.7 or whatever, and, and that's where the Maple Leafs are. So um, I, I think finding a way to generate more consistently at, at five on five would probably be the, the number one thing I would say that they can uh, improve on over the next 60 games. Well, I also think that, you know, in the, in the first segment, we talked about goaltending and who's so and whatnot. And now all of a sudden there is a, obviously a very large discourse going around the fan base about Nadelkovich just because of his early season. I think it's fair to call them struggles early in the season and, and his last Two outings are, have been super like hit or miss. Like obviously uh, against Buffalo, that was a really slow start to the game, and then a really good finish to the game. He came yeah. in relief two games ago and looks pretty decent. But I think there is a beginning of a conversation about goaltending outside of Huso. So just talk about that so far this season, and and what I guess you see in Ned or an alternative if it's not Ned. It's interesting because I feel like what we're seeing with Huso right now, 
very similar to what we saw with the Delkovich at the start of last year, where he comes in and, and he has a pretty strong first couple months. And then, you know, they, they start to really lean on him. And what happened with Nadelkovich was he seemed like he was maybe overworked. He started to lose it a little bit and, and obviously things spiraled. My sense just on Huso as a goaltender is he's probably doesn't have the same propensity to, to spiral. He doesn't seem like he goes through as much of the streakiness um, just from a short sample of, of covering both of them. Um, but I do think the overwork is a real thing. You're not talking about a guy who has several seasons of 50 games under his belt here. And that was the case with Nadelkovich too. So um, I, I think the Red Wings probably need to be a little careful to not uh, go through the exact same fate. And, and I think they probably did go too long between the Delkovic starts, um, you know, leading up to, up to last night, he obviously got into the game that Huso got pulled and you wonder if fatigue was at all a factor there. I mean, it's, it's a lot of hockey for a guy who's not used to starting. I think that was his sixth start in a row for, for Huso. So um, that's one thing I think about it. You know, I, I believe in the Delkovic, talent. Um, I, I really do. I think he can make the, the spectacular save and that is, that's a rare thing. Um, I also think what you have to kind of live with with him is the occasional, what was that? It's kind of a Mike Smith effect, mm -hmm. right? And I could understand um, if certain, certainly like if, if Detroit is feeling like, well, with where that team is, that's they don't want to ride that roller coaster quite so often. But I, I do think Nadelkovich is going to steal you games and sometimes maybe it goes the other way as well. So to me, I, I think he's a good goalie to have on your team. If if Huso was to get hurt, like Nedeljkovic can go, can get hot and and carry a win streak. Nedeljkovic can win you a playoff series at some point, you know. It, but it can also go the other way, and I think that's why, if you're planning on him as your true number one, that's probably the consideration that teams are making. But I really believe in his talent, and and I like that he's as he's as outwardly competitive as he is. I, I to me, that's an appealing thing in a goalie. I kind of like that gamer goalie, and and I candidly i like mike smith too so I, I know i'm a little bit of on an island um in, in that camp sometimes but to me i i, I like nadelkovich I, I think he's a good goalie i also understand why you maybe want Huso as kind of your steady night to night guy but i would be working nadelkovich in there uh, i think more often than they have that being said i do understand like the numbers haven't been good for him so far this year and that's not irrelevant so um I don't know. It's it's kind of a, I don't know if that really answers your question, but it's it's a little bit of uh, I I can kind of see it both ways. I I kind of got to fight what I what I maybe think and feel of just like man, you love having that goalie who can who you know at any given night can stop forty shots and steal a game for for you against Vegas or whatever. If he was to start the other night, I think he could do that. Um, but you also saw two or maybe three goals uh, last night that, that probably shouldn't go in, which happened to Huso too, but it hasn't happened to Huso nearly as often. Yeah. I mean that what you said is a lot of what Scotty and I, I feel with, um, with Nadelkovich as well. Cause with Huso, you kind of know for the most part, what you're going to get out of him every single night, he's going to give you an opportunity to win. Um, and we, Scotty and I had discussions about at what point do you give Huso a break? Do you continue to ride him while he's hot until he has that bad game, which he inevitably had? Or do you work Nadelkovich in there and just hope Nadelkovic can hold it down, even though he's not playing well? Because at some point you do have to play Nadelkovic just because yeah. he needs to get a game in there as well. Like he can't just sit on the, the pine for all seasons. That, that's not good for him. Um, so it was it was definitely a conversation. And one thing I've noticed a lot with Nadelkovic is he seems to be less fundamentally sound than Huso is. I think Huso's got the is is like you said, more consistent, more fundamental in the net. He plays his angles better, but Nadelkovic might not have that, but he makes over, makes it up with an overabundance of athleticism. Super athletic. Totally. Yeah. So and so but sometimes that too. gets him into trouble Which, like, because he's so athletic. Right. Yeah. It's like giveth and taketh with the aggressiveness too. And the same, you know, same conversation, the same breath as everything you just said for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that they haven't had these back to backs is probably exacerbated. Like, you know, this weekend they're going to have consecutive games on Saturday and Sunday, Vegas and Columbus. They're going to have to go to different goalies those two nights. So there you go. Net, net will get one of those who will get one of those. And, and that works. And when there's one of those, at least every couple of weeks, you're fine. You, you can ride who so, pretty heavily as long as you're, you're still mixing the Delkovic in there and as long as he's still getting uh, his, his rest there. But when you have it, a schedule kind of like they have, you know, the, the six games in a row, like all of a sudden that starts to add up for both guys. And so uh, I, I think that there's probably a, maybe a tighter balance than the one that they have struck so far. 
But I also think that could happen somewhat organically uh, just with the way the schedule will, will start to shake out uh, after too long here. But I don't know. I, I know there's some, there's some frustration out there on, uh, on the dog, which I certainly see it when I, when I look at my Twitter mentions, but I, I really am a believer in what you guys said. I think the, the athleticism and the aggressiveness is, is really valuable. I mean, you, you see in, in, a, in a given game, it, it can be the difference, but I, you know, I, I also get it, you know, over the course of a season, it's, it's what you said. It's, it's giveth and it's, it's taketh away. Absolutely. Uh, when we come back, we'll, I have a couple more, que- a couple more questions about the quarter of the reason season check-in, but then also preview the game against the Vegas Golden Knights that takes place on Saturday with Max um, and all that and more on the other side of this break on Lockdown Red Wings. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We're joined by Max Boltman, Detroit Red Wings beat writer for The Athletic, and he's helping us check in on the 25% of the way through the season. Red Wings currently sit in a playoff spot. Um, the last question I really had is a two-parter. And that question is, is what player has been your number one standout performer thus far? And that's a tough question because there's been several players, I think, that are worthy of that nomination. And then what player on the opposite side has under-impressed you, underperformed your expectation? It's a great question. Both of them are great questions. There's a few ways to take it. I mean, like – it feels boring to say Dylan Larkin. I still think he's their best player. I don't oh. think he's overperformed my expectations, though, right? Like, I think he's been their clear best player on a night-to-night basis, probably has raised his level a little bit, um, and, and has been really impressive. But it's pretty similar to what you've come to expect, I think, from Dylan Larkin. So I, I won't say him, even though I think he's been their best player. Um, I almost want to say David Perron, mm-hmm. uh, but he has a pretty high – threshold too right? like, <laughs> you know he's been really impressed i think he's probably the biggest reason that the power play has improved his comfort level holding on to the puck uh, down low making plays for them um and then you could go with dominic kubalik who i i think uh you know obviously production wise is making that contract look ridiculous by the day i mean they were in fact they were able to give him for two years 2.5 million and i think he's still hovering at a point per game right now slowed down just a little bit lately but um, yeah, he could have easily had two goals last night. So, um, I, I guess I'll probably lean Kubalik just because I think you expect when you go sign David Perron, I think you expect something like this. He just happens to also be better than I maybe realized. Kubalik's probably the guy who's outperformed the most. I, the guy I think you, you're probably left wanting a little more from is probably Mo Sider. And, and I, I think he's a young guy. And, and so I don't think it's anything to, to panic about. I, I, I still think he's tremendous. He's probably the, the, the biggest talent that the Red Wings have in long term, you know, a guy like a six foot four defenseman who has offense, who hits like that, who can defend like that. Who's as smart as that uh, skates like that. You know, that's just such a rare piece, probably the hardest to find piece that, that, uh, that you can have in hockey and, and they have it in more cider. But I think if maybe if we expected the Calder year to just launch into this, kind of Makar, Adam Fox dominance in year two, which is kind of what happened for those guys. Um, I don't think that's quite happened yet, but I don't want to rule out that it could over the course of the later parts of the year. I mean, he's that talented, but I think you've just kind of seen, you know, he and Ben Sherratt maybe haven't clicked quite as perfectly as, as you'd hope. Um, and, and I think sometimes early in the, I think he's done a better job lately or early in the year oh, where yeah. there were some turnovers um, that I think he'd probably want back, but I think he's reined that in over the last seven, eight games. And, and I think that's, that's mostly seemed to be, uh, solving itself. And I think the whole thing could, could pretty well solve itself too. Um, but in terms of just raw expectations, I think one of my bold predictions coming into the year was he'd finish top 10 for the Norris. That doesn't look like it's in the cards. Um, but long-term, I still believe that that's the player he is. I think he's that good. I think he's going to be an, an elite NHL defenseman. Scott, you got anything you want to move on? Um, I don't think so. Like, I, I, I did want to, if we have time, I'd like really quickly your thoughts on Bert since he's come back. Just like, I, I know that that's been a, a, a conversation that a lot of people have had as well about maybe his, uh, since coming back from injury, the production not being what we're used to from him. Is that like a cause for concern? Is everything fine? Is his future with the team changed in the last couple of weeks? Just, I, I know everybody has an opinion on Bird, so I wanted yours. That's all. Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think anything's changed in the last couple of weeks. I do think since he's come back, though, you've seen, you know, over the over the course of his time in Detroit, there there are these phases where he'll look like he's really trying to do a lot. And one of the things that makes him a, a rare player 
and a player who's been so good for the Red Wings is the fact that he can blend this kind of toughness to his game um, with being legitimately really skilled and, and a pretty smart player. And sometimes, though, he leans really deeply into the skill side and, and the all kind of offense side go between guys' legs and, and it turns into kind of turnovers at the blue lines and um, stuff like that. And I think this has kind of been one of those stretches for him. They usually don't last too long. He usually finds his game um, – pretty quickly but that's what i've noticed i don't think I, I think he has had a rocky time since he came back from the broken hand and and we'll see what his status is obviously um on friday when next time they practice after he took another puck off the hand really hope obviously uh that that's you know he, he, you'd be devastated for him to have to go through that again so soon after coming back from one of those um you know I, but i i just think there's too much track record on tyler bertuzzi to think that you know he's been zapped of his powers in a space sure. jam like fashion right like he's sure. he's a good player so i i think i think the puck management has been what's done him in um but i you know i think that there have been stretches like that over his career and he's usually found a way to come back from it long-term future your guess is as good as mine um if there's not a contract extension in place by the deadline i mean i think everyone here knows how that tends to go uh mm -hmm. for pending ufas on on teams that aren't you know squarely contenders so a um, little bit of a ticking clock there, and that, I think that would make the the concept of an injury even more, you know, eyebrow raising. Yeah. Right, sure. but um, you know, I I still think you know Tyler Bertuzzi's got a lot of a lot of good hockey in there. He's he's only what twenty seven years old, going to turn yeah. twenty eight yeah. during this season. So, okay, uh, let's transition now. Talking about the Vegas Golden Knights game that's taking place on Saturday. They're playing both Vegas and Columbus this weekend, but we're only going to have time to preview one. So let's preview the game against the team that the Red Wings haven't played uh, yet so far this season. The Vegas Golden Knights so far this season sit first in the Pacific Division uh, with a record of 17-6-1. Their leading scorer is Jack Eichel with 26 points in 24 games played as he uh, is beginning to prove the doubters of his talent wrong after his return last season was a little bit subpar coming off an injury who would have guessed that a guy would have <laughs> performed underperformed coming off a major surgery like that uh goaltenders logan thompson aiden hill both playing really well thompson especially with a 921 save percentage in 16 games played uh they are second in the league in expected goals four at five on five but both their power play and penalty kill are um below 20th in the league so, uh, Max, when looking at the Vegas Golden Knights, what do the Red Wings have to do playing at home to try and steal a win? First things first, I think they're going to have to try to score some goals. I mean, the, Vegas' <laughs> weakness coming into the season, you, you looked at them and you thought, how how is this going to go for them in net, right? Obviously, they have the Robin Leonard injury, um, and, and you think, okay, suddenly this team that has all the, you know, they, they start as this team of misfits and everybody's leftovers, and you wake up one day and they've got Jack Eichel and, Stone, uh, Alex Petrangelo, yeah. right. And, and they have all these, you know, Shea Theodore, who was one of those original players, but who's elevated himself into that tier of kind of star level players. Um, you know, they're, they're not that team anymore. And you look at them and you say, are oh, they have all these stars, but this glaring Achilles heel and net. Um, the answer so far has been no. Logan Thompson has been awesome for them. He's got like a 920 save percentage. Um, it, but I still think, you know, you look at, at uh, as good as he's been, the track record does not tell you he's this unbeatable player. And I think it's, it starts with being able to score a couple goals on on him. And if you can do that, then the Red Wings, I think, are pretty well built to protect the leads. Um, obviously, we just saw him chase down a lead a couple nights ago, but I, I wouldn't, if I were them, advise getting into that habit, especially against teams like Vegas, who um, are equipped to, to just shut you down and and the game can be over if, if you're down 4-1, certainly after two periods. It, it, it should be against Vegas. So um, that's where it starts. I think you, you're probably going to see a, a Dylan Larkin, Jack Eichel head-to-head -head matchup. And, um, you know, historically, I, you know, they've, those two guys have seen a lot of each other. Um, so that that's kind of the intrigue. That, that's probably the fun matchup that I would guess you'll probably see. And it'll probably go a long way toward toward deciding the game. But to me, it starts with if the Red Wings are going to win it, they probably need to, to take an early lead and, and try to hold on to it. In net, do we kind of assume Huso for Vegas and Ned for Columbus? Uh, yeah, that could be. Uh, who, who got Columbus last time? Did they go to Huso again? Yeah, they've been yeah. riding Huso since uh, he got on his hot streak. Yeah, I, that could that could be a logical way to go for it because you don't also don't want to have Huso sit for, I guess, just one 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 day difference. That's probably my guess. Is, is probably what they do. Um, but you could see the logic in, in going either way with it too. Um, but I, I would guess, Scotty, yeah, that you're probably right. 
All right. And then, uh, so we don't have official over under numbers yet because this game's on Saturday and we're recording this on Thursday. But it's I think usually it's, six and a half. It's like usually always, six though. and yeah. a half. So let's just assume six and a half. Are you thinking the over or the under? I gave someone really bad over under <laughs> advice a couple weeks we, ago. We don't keep track, so don't worry about it. <laughs> We only we only take credit when we're right. We don't talk about it. Exactly. I think, mentally, I think mentally I still haven't adjusted to the high fly in 2022-23 in NHL because my gut says under. My gut says probably a 4-2 game. But uh, I don't know. It, it Obviously, it seems like uh, if they've moved the over-under lineup, that kind of tells you that the scoring's up enough to yeah. justify it. I'm going to take the under, but, but uh, don't get mad at me if I'm wrong. I'll take the over. Uh, they hit the over easily like in, in the game against Buffalo. Um, I think it's going to be one of those games that surprises you. The, the I think the Vegas Golden Knights are kind of due for a, a flop coming up here soon, and I would love it if the Red Wings are the team to to give it to them because really good teams tend to underestimate the teams they think they should be, and uh, they probably come in coming into Detroit. I think this is a winnable game. I'm, I'll go with the under. I, I think I don't know, like. Home ice, they they have played well. Who so if we assume he's in that too? I, I like the under as well. But see, that's exactly why. Like the fact that you have two goalies going in net that you think unless they put Aiden Hill in there, which in that case it's it's it could be open season. But if they put both those guys in there, you th- look at that game and you think, oh, this is going to be a low scoring game. And those are the well, ones you're that trying always to big brain you. this. Oh, I'm you're just like, trying. Oh, I'm, I'm reverse psychologi- <laughs> psychologizing the jinx. That's not right. You're that, using but. reverse psychology on a something that doesn't have a brain. <laughs> hey, just like you. What? Okay. <laughs> what? What's a crazy stray, but fair. Uh, all right. So, Max, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Do you have anything you want to throw out there at the end of the episode? Any anything? Any shout outs you want to give? No, I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you very much. It's always uh, always fun to be on with you. Oh, we appreciate having you. Um, it's always actually uh, here's here's a shout out. Shout out! Uh, a couple of my coworkers got nominated for uh, Michigan Sports Writer of the Year uh, this week. Colton Pouncey, who covers Alliance for us, and, and Brandon Quinn, who covers college basketball, uh, exceptionally well deserved for, for both awesome. of them. There's there's a good shout out. I didn't have any when you when you when you first threw it to me, but that's that's a good one. <laughs> it's a good shout out to give. Uh, we'll be good. back on Monday with two game recaps because there's two games this weekend. Uh, same time, same place. Wait, wait, Scotty, any final thoughts? We ball. We ball. There it is. Thanks for remembering. Same, I remembered this time. Same time, same place. It's your team every, every day. day.